We're back this afternoon at uh, Bonner First Baptist Church with Dee Dee Martin is going to be our moderator and Bo is going to be on the panel along with myself. And the message this morning was on the last days of Paul. And so we'll turn it over to you, Dee Dee. Okay. Well, we'll just get started. Okay. In learning about Paul and who he was, his conversion on the Damascus Road, the missionary journeys, and the way he suffered for the gospel, I brought to mind Acts 9, 15 through 16, where God tells Ananias to minister to Paul. And Ananias doesn't want to, but goes anyway. Um, God says to, says to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Well, in reading that, I tend to gloss over the suffer part. My mind, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> and um, we, we don't like to think about suffering. Uh, our Western mindset basically thinks suffering is bad. And I know these questions are just speculative, so... How do you think Paul would respond to our view of that of our mindset now, the Western mindset of suffering? I think I think he responds in when he says that he counts it worthy to suffer for Christ, and that our suffering can certainly not be to the level that Christ was. And so I you know, from one culture to another, I think it's sometimes it's helpful to, to look at the culture from which these writers came, the men who were moved by God to write scripture, so that uh, we do get a little more of a, maybe a, a challenge to put ourselves in, in their situation. Yeah, I think he probably had uh, the greatest perspective of all about it because he, you know, in his letters, he writes, I just, I count these momentary troubles so yeah. light and not worthy in comparison, the glories ahead. So he knew it right off the bat that was in store for him. And, you know, it, it did not cause him to shrink back in any way, obviously. And he was just compelled to be obedient. I think what's interesting in that passage, though, is it obviously shows that nothing happened outside of the plan of God, but it was certainly part of his plan. That, that way he was going to be, he was going to have to suffer. And part of that suffering resulted in the furtherance of the gospel, the spread of the gospel, and the spread of the church, church and all. So, you know, it does kind of run counter to the notion we have today where if you become a Christian, everything's going to be perfect. You know, God offers this wonderful plan for you, and as though there were, there's not a call to suffer. Yeah. And, but Jesus says, if you follow me, you're going to encounter trouble in this world. But be, take heart. I've overcome the world. So. Right. That leads into my second question. How would Paul respond to the prosperity gospel or viewpoint in light of suffering? Yeah, that kind of goes with it. It's just, it just shows that that is a man-made doctrine because it's not, it's not made by God. God, again, right off the bat told Paul that's, that's part of his service of him was going to include suffering. And it wasn't a result of any disobedience of Paul. In fact, it was a result of his obedience that he was going to suffer. And I would say, too, that is the, the demonstrative point that this is a man-made uh, message because it says if you do well, you will get good things. If you believe enough, if you do enough, if you pray enough, if you have expectation enough, that God's going to reward that. And Scripture doesn't teach that God is a God of quid pro quo. It's not, a, it's not a status quo gospel. It's a gospel that says Jesus has paid it all and he has called upon us to believe in him and to trust him in all things. And it is true. I mean, you could try to cite scriptural support in the Old sure. Testament. Absolutely. You know, that you do well, you obey God, God will bless you and things, you know, will go well for you. I mean, you could cite passages to that but it isn't just no, as mechanical it's, as it's, that. It's to a, it, and that's to a theocracy. It's to Israel. Most of that right, that they cite right. is to a theocracy. And uh, that theocracy never even in, really enjoyed those blessings because they didn't get it right. Yeah. Oh, and I, the flip side of that, too, then would be, okay, if you want the blessings of the Old Testament, what about the curses? Mm -hmm. You know, you read a Deuteronomy 28, and it says, if you do this great, great things will happen. If you do this, great, great things will happen. Now, if you don't do this, you're going to be thrown out of the land. Mm 
you know, and, and on and on. Well, do they want that kind of quid pro quo yeah. gospel? I don't think they do. Okay. Knowing that Paul and others have suffered greatly, suffering that we cannot even imagine, how does this help in showing us the truth of their experience of Christ and of Christ himself? I think for a man like Paul who had the station in his religion that he did, who had the prospects that he did, for him to give that up, which would not have required suffering. I don't think that as a Pharisee, if he continued on in the council and, and risen in the ranks and he was, he was ahead of his class, he says that himself, his lot would not have been suffering depending on which side of the war of 8070 he was on, but uh, for the most part, his career would have, would have been a very subtle career, very comfortable, very respectable, not like what is said in Acts 28, 22, that everyone was against them. And I think Paul could say, you know, he, say, he does say in, in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, I've suffered from my countrymen and from the Gentiles. Can you add, what was, uh, say the last part of the question again, Dee Dee? How does this help in showing us the truth of their experience of Christ and of Christ himself? So I yeah. gave part A, go ahead, part B. <laughs> well, how does it show the truth of it? I mean, obviously they're willing to suffer for it, and you wouldn't, if it was all a lie or at least um, something you didn't have firm convictions in, then obviously with the, when you encounter suffering or any adversity, it'd be easier to let go of that. And like, well, I'm not going down that road. I'm not that committed to it. But they were obviously convinced that it was the truth or it is the truth. And, uh, you know, it just shows um, their willingness to go all the way. I mean, not just with Paul, but obviously the yeah. 12, well, the 11 disciples, other than John, I guess they all, tradition holds, died a martyr's death because they were so firmly convicted in the belief of the truth. Of yeah, and, and there was not one exception. There was not one breakaway. Right. Saved Judas yeah. at the beginning, and Jesus predicted that. There was no defections. Mm -hmm. And having mentioned that, martyred, um, you said Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen, and the other apostles were mo that were crucified were crucified because they were not, they were not Roman mm -hmm. citizens, and that's the only reason. Yeah, of course. I don't know how many were crucified. I'd have to go back through the Book of Martyrs. I mean, yeah. they, were, they were impaled. They were boiled in oil. They were a lot of things. Right. Yeah. The only one that comes to mind is Peter was crucified, crucified upside, upside down. down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. When Paul arrives at Rome and tells the Jewish leaders he's not guilty of any crime, this was Acts, you know, verse 22, um, against the people and he appealed to Caesar, the Jewish leaders had not received any letters or reports about Paul regarding his arrest or any information. Would information have been sent to Rome preceding Paul's arrival regarding the charges against him? Because it seems they would have had enough time to do that when you see how far, how long it took Paul to get to Rome. Well, they, they had to do a formal charge. Yeah, yeah. they did. And, and, and uh, Festus was responsible to write the formal charge. The Jewish leaders then would be responsible to prosecute the charge. Um, I, I don't know if they, you know, Paul talks about his first offense. No one stood with him. Um, I don't know. It could be a timing thing because they had to get there the same way Paul did by, by ship. And apparently it was the time of year when ships were beginning not to sail and so maybe their ship was later I, that would just be speculation but at the time he gets there he is there before anybody else there doesn't seem to be a lot of zeal in their plans to get their right. guys there even with the charge they didn't have any evidence at least I mean if they had the right. charge there's no evidence that's right proving the case at least you know in that section of the passage and it prob at. probably would have been at their expense too you know, in the, in the passage, Bo, is it in 24 or 25, they actually hire lawyers to bring the charges against Paul at Caesarea. Um, so it, it probably would cost them a lot to do this too. And it's like I said, every time Paul left the Jerusalem, I think every Jew there, including Christian Jews, were like, good to see you go, Paul. It was not, you know, nice for you to have been here. We're glad to see you go. Yeah. It didn't make me think, I kind of go along with that question, though. Um, you know, I know we can't be real definitive about it, and it may be just speculation talking here, but why 
Paul was released at the end of his first Roman imprisonment mm -hmm. versus why just a few years later he was executed at the end of his second imprisonment, other than it just obviously being the divine will of God that he that, that was to be the case. But what what was the difference? It, it, the second time around, Nero just like, oh, this is enough. You know, I'm tired of him being a troublemaker. We're just going to end this. And I, th I think that it's part of Nero's modus operandi at the time. He's, he's killing Christians. Why not one of the most famous? Uh, probably before in, in the first trial, he's not as prejudiced. And, and again, if the, if the evidence had been the same as it was in Jerusalem, even the governors in Jerusalem were like, you guys don't have a case against this man. This man has done nothing wrong. That, that could have been the case. Uh, but for sure, Nero's plot to make the Christians a scapegoat, definitely Paul's death falls within that influence. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I think if, if the two imprisonment theory is right, I don't think he was executed for the, for the charges of the Jews. I think he was executed for the charge. I think the Romans are the prosecutors now because he is part of this seditious group that has burned the city and, and uh, he's a ringleader. Okay. That answer, the, the follow on question was, um, cause he stayed there for two years you know, under house arrest, mm -hmm. but he, um, people came and talked to him. He boldly preached about Jesus unhindered those two years. So those two years, he was waiting for his case to come to trial, and it either was dismissed or never did. Yeah, That's and another the question, too, that people often ask, and again, I think Bo's answer, this is the plan of God, it's the sovereignty yeah. of God, but why does it end there? Why does the Acts. book of Acts end yeah. so ab abruptly right there? Um, if, if he was tried and... and and found guilty, at that point, why wouldn't Luke have told us that? Again, that's just yeah. God's sovereignty. Course, and really, neither, either way, he didn't tell us the outcome. No, he it doesn't. just let, you know, the gospel continued, you know, and, and, and maybe it was to fulfill maybe that, that theme of Acts, that yeah. it'll be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Jane, the end of the world, mm -hmm. end of the earth, the known world, the Mediterranean world, mm -hmm. and then when he got to Rome, it showed the fulfillment of that, and Maybe Luke's focus isn't really Paul per se, but the God's plan. I, I, and I think that's fruition. true too. And, the, and, and you know, at every division of Acts, it, it, it ends with the gospel is going right. one more step. The gospel is going one more step. So, yeah, I, I think that's definitely part of it. Was his two years um, under house arrest, that was at Rome's expense? At Rome what now? At Rome's expense. His two years of imprisonment. I don't imprisonment. know. It says that he rented his own house. Right. That's yeah. I, I don't know. The jury may be out on that. I, I just thought it would be very ironic that you know, the gospel the spread. Paid, and, I, 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 Rome's the, Rome, the Romans paid to get him there. Yeah. 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 You know, Tacitus, I don't know if you caught this or not in his, in his response, but he says, um, but in Rome itself, the, the, the home of the plague, but in Rome itself where all the horrible and shameful things in the world collect and find a home. That's kind of like what we would say about New York City or, you know, uh, Los Angeles or something like that. I mean, if it's, if it's shameful, if it's bad, then it's going to take off there. And he's saying the same thing about Rome because it is an international city. Yeah. Kind of like Vegas. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking kind of like Vegas. <laughs> yeah, Vegas. Yeah, that's yeah. a great example. Okay. Did or could Paul have any idea that when he was writing to churches and to Timothy and Titus would become scripture? I know that's speculation. I don't know. <laughs> that's a deeper question. That we could, I mean, like I could, I could, um, you know, I could cite a passage. I would question it. Like he says, I don't know if it's First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, where. He says, the Lord says this about marriage or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he says, First and I say this. Mm -hmm. You know, and he makes it sound like this is my personal opinion. I get, you know. Yeah. And not necessarily on the same part of Scripture. You could make that, but maybe it's included in there. Anyway, I don't know. You could. 
I mean, it'd be hard for me to understand how Peter could ascribe it to be Scripture, and Paul himself, the author of it, wouldn't right. say this is on equal par as Scripture. So I would say overall, yeah, I think he would know that certainly he's divinely inspired and that um, he, he, he writes with such authority and over churches. So, yeah, I would think he, he uh, yeah. Oh, and then thinking it out as you ask the question, I think you to, would to, recognize it's to, to be go scripture. back. I think a, in a, a good idea of this is to make how it may play out is if you if you watch uh, the movie Paul the Apostle. Luke Luke goes to his cell and he says the, the churches need to have this. They need to have this story. The churches need this encouragement. And I think at that point, I mean, that's certainly licensed, Hollywood license. But I, I think Paul does understand that the churches need this encouragement. And here's another thing to add to just add to your point. When he writes these churches, he defends his apostleship every time. I mean, he, he wants them to know he is an apostle. That's very important. How important is it that we know that 2 Timothy is likely Paul's last words? Does this book deserve closer attention or a different perspective than 1 Timothy or Titus? That is a good question. Well, I would answer that almost like, um, you know, obviously everything Jesus said is important. And it's the, the words of God himself. But in the focus of the, especially the Gospel of John, the, the last discourse and his yeah. final week, I would, I would say even his, his last teachings before he's arrested, crucified, and ascends, and then even after, or right before his ascension, I would say his words even carry a special significance. And everything he said was, is certainly truth and, and had authority and came from God himself because he is God. Um, but in the same way, I think, I mean, everything Paul writes is scripture and, and is certainly truth, but yeah, I think there's something significant about Second Timothy where he, at the end of it all, he says, I have fought the good fight, you know, and he, 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 he holds up scripture to be God-breathed, the great quote about scripture itself contained in Second Timothy. And it is a very personal, intimate type of epistle letter. I mean, designed for the church to read, not just Timothy, because he, you know, he, he, in the very last phrase of it is, the Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you, and it's in the plural. Um, you, plural. So, yeah. anyway, yeah, I think it's special. Yeah, I can't add to that. That's his, his, his analogy of drawing in the farewell discourse of Jesus, I think, makes the point. In the sermon, you mentioned life can sometimes be just one thing after another. I was kind of worried about that because I used the title in the book. I mean, I guess not well, a lot of guys I, would do I, that. I was counting in the second <laughs> service. And I was, in the first service, I heard you say that. And I was like, I wonder if he'll say that online. But I was gone, so I guess you did. I watched on second service. You did. <laughs> okay. All right. I wasn't sure if you were going to do that. I'll have to ask the audience when we're done. I, mean, man, I didn't want to offend anybody, but that is the title of the book. Oh, you know? didn't so. offend me. I, I <laughs> chuckled. Anyway. Okay, that sometimes life can just one, be one thing after another. Paul's journey to Rome, most like, he most likely felt that way in his journey. We may not be called to suffer like Paul did. How can we as believers be encouraged by his life when we face our one more thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think Paul's example for us, and of course the ultimate example is Jesus himself, which Paul often points to. Uh, and the fact that we can say, well, you know, Paul, God told Paul that he was going to suffer. Well, he's told us through the scripture that we're going to suffer. And there's going to be, there's going to be good things in life. You know, there's some things in life that, you know, it's sometimes it's just one good thing after another. And, and, and I think we should be equally surprised at that as we are when it's one bad thing after another. Um, I, I always get amazed when people say, when something good happens to them, God is so good. And I'm like... Yeah, and when something bad happens to us, God is still as good as he was when bad happened to us, or when good happened to us. And one thing, one advantage I think we have in looking at Paul is to answer that question is, I know he obviously went through a lot of persecution, a lot of different 
difficult circumstances and was in prison um, and in, in a dungeon, as we were talking about earlier before we went online. But just think, consider what good God brought out of that. Yeah. I mean, we have these epistles. Yeah. You know, if he went on his missionary journey, um, it'd be good for those churches. But, I mean, 2,000 years later, I don't know there'd be churches in those locations where he visited. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of his, uh, well, as a result of his being in prison and dungeon, we have not just First and Second Timothy and Titus, but we have Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, the other prison epistles. So again, looking back, we had the perspective like God worked it together for good, even mm -hmm. though it was yep. divinely appointed that he would suffer for us to enjoy that good. Yeah, and I think that's a, a wonderful thing for us to remember, that God, in the end, and sometimes in this life we, we can see that, sometimes we don't. Right. Um, it's just, it's a matter of trust. And is, is God good? Is God trustworthy? And I think when the thing that we have that Paul didn't have as much, but we have not only the teaching of Jesus, but we do have the life of Paul, and we have the life of Peter, and we can see how their suffering worked out for God's greater good and God's greater glory. And so I think that's, I think we have the advantage there. I just wish, and I was thinking when you answered this too, I just wish that when I suffered, it wasn't for my foolishness. Right. You know, I, I, if I'm going to suffer, I want to suffer because I am a Christian. Now, we're all going to suffer aches and pains as we get older, but if, if I'm going to be talked bad about or whatever, I want it to be because of Christ. Okay. Well, those are all the questions I have. And you mentioned this was the um, part five of the life of Paul. Yeah. So what starts next Well, we're actually going to read. We're doing a series on the pastoral epistles. We're actually going to read from a pastoral epistle uh, this coming Sunday, God six willing. Six or seven weeks later. Yeah, six or seven weeks later, we're going to actually get into the letter. And uh, we'll start at First Timothy chapter 1. Look forward to it. <laughs> all okay. right. All right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight for this time we've had together. I pray that as it goes online and as we think about it here after the uh, panel discussion is over with, our, with the class that's here, that people will be built up in the faith and that people will just drink deeply from your truth. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.